There we go. Today is day two of the USAS overview, and we're gonna be going over the expenditure process. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to speak up or send us a chat message. If I do miss the chat message, either Amanda will grab or alert me, or you can alert me. Um, again, if you have any questions, somebody else probably has the same question in their head, so don't hesitate. First, I'm going to start with where to find today's um, presentation and the other presentations like yesterday. So where you signed up is over here, but down below there's this ITC overview training with general information up here, our agenda. Um, the PowerPoint that we'll be following, but I'll be back and forth in between the PowerPoint and the live instance, and then uh, the manual as well as the appendix. Now you can see like with uh, USPS, there's the separate presentation. So we'll have that here for ours and then segmented into quick little video like chapters, which we'll have over here when we're done with this week. All right. So let me get the PowerPoint up. Um, the first step is uh, in the expenditure process is actually getting authorization to spend, which is the budgeting process that Amanda went through on uh, Fridays with fiscal. Sorry about that in February, February 17th. So if you wanna reference that, that is recorded. And then we're gonna start with the requisition process, which is really the request to order goods and services. It's really not the official purchase, it's just the request. And we'll go into that in more detail. Then the purchase order is actually the binding agreement with the treasurer sig signature because it actually confirms that the funds will be there for that expenditure. And then the AP invoice is the receipt of the goods and services. And then the payment for the goods and services would be the payables and disbursements. So these processes are what we'll be going over today. So first, some general facts about requisition process, um, because they can be, uh, the process can be controlled by a, vari a, a variety of variables per district based on the district's rules, their processes even outside of the software, um, their roles or permissions, and even their account filters. Now, their account filters would limit the what the user can see um, when creating like the transaction or reports or viewing the account grids. And I will give you an example of that um, in a little bit, using like a cafeteria secretary with with an account filter as well as a requisition prefix. However, most of the day, I'm gonna be logged in as admin user so that I can give you or demo all options to demonstrate, even though with all those variety or variables. <clears throat> um, the requisition is, the process is tracked from requisition to purchase order. And I do have an example of that. So, Hopefully you can see that, but this says add requisition. And over here, it says the requisition number, who did it, which is the admin user, the date it was created and so forth. And then I just took screenshots of the report to make it simpler. But then you can see that this cafe requisition that's up here, cafe 10, was converted to this purchase order. So it is on the audit report if you need to look for that audit trail. Um, 
USAS does have the requisition workflow approval. It's available. We won't be talking about that today. Uh, there is a Fridays with Fiscal in the past re regarding that, and I believe we might have one coming up this year. So by default in the system, requisitions uh, do not require a vendor or an account. And again, rules can be set up for the district so that the district would use that rule to like require a vendor or an account flexibility. When it's in, when the request for goods or services are in the requisition stage, the monies on that requisition are not encumbered on the account, like the expenditure account that Amanda was talking about yesterday, until it is an approved and converted purchase order. However, like I said, there's a lot of variables and there is a pre-encumbrance module that when enabled, the user can see the requisition amount and the remaining balance on that expenditure account. I also have a screenshot of that, of, be, of what both look like, so you are aware. So this is the same account, but this example is the uh, expenditure account that does not have that pre-encumbrance module enabled. So nothing is showing encumbered because it's not a purchase order yet. It's not, uh, nothing's encumbered until the purchase order. If the user does have the pre-encumbrance module enabled, nothing is still showing as encumbered because it's not a purchase order. However, because that is turned on, you can see the balance of expendable. It shows a requisition amount and calculates the remaining balance. So that's the benefit of having that turned on. So those are the two different views of the expenditure account in the requisition process with this enabled or without. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the instance. You get into the requisition menu through the transaction menu. And like many grids, you have all these options on the grids. It allows you to filter by requisition number, any of these fields on the top row. You can print. You can, however, if you, you can click here and it goes right to printing that requisition. But you see how this button isn't enabled yet because you can click select all or one or several to print. All right, so I'm stuck with the little blue bar. That's why I wasn't seeing <laughs> what I was trying to show you. So, I can still talk about the grid function. So this is a view icon. This is an edit, and we'll go in more depth with that because you can only edit a transaction, which a requisition is a transaction. You can only create or modify a transaction in an open period, an open posting period. And currently, you can see what the current period is up here for March 2023. Oh, okay, we're caught up now. What I was trying to show you is as I select several, these come alive or they become enabled where you can convert or print. We have other options on the grid with advanced query. I will show you examples of how that can be used today. And anything on this grid 
whether you have more or less columns can be made into a report by um, clicking on this report button. And like I said, you can have more or less items on the grid by opening up this more button. So this can be useful sometimes when, uh, if you do have the workflow approval module enabled, you might want that on your grid. You might want the username. I thought I had the username, but I don't see it. But you could select a username or created name whether it's converted, the, if it's a template, I mean, you can put whatever's on your grid and as well as making a report. Now, sometimes grids like those account grids that Amanda was showing you yesterday in the account section, the more calculating fields on a grid, the slower sometimes the performance. And although this doesn't have very many calculating uh, columns on this grid, I wanted to point out this reset button because it will go back. It will default back to the default view of the requisition screen without all those uh, extra things that I chose under the more button, like that workflow approval check mark. And this is the default view. So sometimes by using that on any grid in the system, to go back to the default might speed up some performance. All right, so let's create a requisition. We'll talk about the fields. The requisition number uh, can be, let me first explain these. If you have this checked mark, as soon as I save this, after this is all filled out, as soon as I save it, with this checked, it'll go come back to a blank requisition to continually um, enter the requisition. If you don't have that checked and you have this, as soon as you have this information completed and you click save, it'll close out this pop-up box. And if you have neither, and you click save, you're going to have to manually click this X. So just some random tips. The requisition number can be entered or auto assigned, and it's auto assigned based on the setup under system configuration. under the transaction configuration. The requisition number can be up to eight characters long. It can use a prefix. And again, I'm gonna show you one used with a cafe secretary example. Including that prefix, it's still eight characters long. The in regards to the prefix, let me talk about that and I'll give you an example. Let's look at the cafeteria filter. This is gonna, if I apply this filter to a user, it's gonna only allow these two accounts, 006 and the purchase services and 006 and the supply accounts for the 006 funds. Now looking at the user, the cafe secretary, I have, I'm gonna make this darker just by editing it. I have that filter selected on this user so they can only see those accounts. And then I also assigned a requisition prefix. So here's the requisition prefix. If I have, um, oh, there's, this is also another tip throughout the system is these, if, as you hover over, these pop-up tips come up. So, and this is what I was gonna tell you that when this box is checked, the, the user will be able to see any and all cafe requisitions 
with the prefix cafe. And I'll give you that example. Without this, they will be able to see any other recs besides having that cafe view. So let's log into the cafe secretary and I'll show you what I mean. And then we'll go back to the requisition. Okay, remember this cafe secretary had an account filter. So they will only be able to see the 006 funds. And because of the restricted box being checked on the prefix of the cafe, she, they can only see the cafe requisitions. They're restricted. However, you notice that other users have entered, I mean, we're logged in as the cafe secretary, but the admin user entered a cafe rec, a username page entered the cafe rec. So they're allowed to see other requisitions with that prefix, but when you restrict them, that's all they can see. Any questions on that? I'll go back to the admin view where we're creating a requisition. And we talked about that first field of the requisition number and the ability to put that prefix and what that prefix does to the requisition. Okay, so the next field would be the date. That's gonna to default to the current date, but you can use that calendar to choose. And then if you tab, I mean, you can use the mouse or tab, but the next one would be here, which is the vendor field. And remember, the by default, without those special rules set up for districts, by default, the vendor does not have to be chosen at this stage of the process. And neither does the account at this stage, not until invoicing time. And we'll talk about that process in a little bit. So if left blank, what that indicates is It'll either be assigned later for a vendor or a vendor will later be assigned. I just don't know um, where I'm going to get this product yet. So I'll leave it blank and assign it later. Or it can be like a mileage requisition or something and multiple vendors will be paid on this purchase order. So that's another reason why you would use it, leave it blank. You can start typing. To find your vendor, like if I'm looking for Gordon Foods, you can um, use this drop down and scroll. That's going to be the longest to look for your vendor. Or even, let me go back to the blank. You know it's a bakery, for instance, and you, you just don't know which bakery it was that had the best donuts. So you can search with using the uh, percent sign. And if I put bakery, all the, excuse me, all the vendors with the word bakery will be listed. Not that's, that's gonna tell me which one has the favorite donut, but it might ring a bell which name it was. We're gonna think it's gonna be LaGrange Bakery for instance. Uh, let's see, was there, oh, I just wanted to mention too that um, the ability to import vendors, like if you had a whole bunch to add under the core vendor menu, the ability to import vendors is available. I'm not gonna show this, but the process is similar to what I will show you later, which is the importing of uh, I'm going to show you the process of importing purchase orders. And so in the manual, in all these chapters, if you're importing vendors, 
it does have the import criteria listed in the manual. It has the template worksheet and it has the criteria and formats that are required. Just wanted to mention that. Oops. So then the next field would be description. I don't believe this is limited. So you can enter whatever you need to describe for training purposes. You can utilize the deliver by date if you want to, like if there's a, a drop dead deadline or something that you want to let the vendor know, you can enter it or choose with the icon. The delivery address, where do these come from? These come from the setup under the core delivery addresses. And you, you see that there's two of the same one. Well, I can't tell right now. I don't know if it's my morning eyes or if it's something beyond, but as users go in there and start typing, it will set up another delivery address, even if you don't want it. So they should use the drop down and choose which one they need. And I probably did that because I believe the other day there was only one in there. And it'll populate down here as you choose or select what's in here. Terms. That's the terms that you want to set with the vendor. You can put attention, Mr. Bill, department, whatever. This is going to be automatically populated, the gray created date. That's going to be default to today. And then the converted box, let me take a sip. When this is a saved requisition, right now we're creating it, but once it's saved and once it's converted into a purchase order, this box will be checked on, on like a requisition when you view it after it's been saved, if that makes sense. This can be used and it's optional, but it's it came from like the days of the USAS web where you could save a template of a requisition. The template requisitions, if checked, is gonna be just that, a template. So I'm not sure the advantage one way or the other, whether it's easier to clone a previous requisition or if you just use the template requisition. I'm not sure the difference, but in my mind, I think it works the same. The template does not impact those expenditure accounts that Amanda talked about yesterday. And that includes whether that pre-encumbrance module is enabled or not, because again, it's just a template. So maybe I could see this being used with a monthly insurance bill that you want where the amounts are pretty much the same, but the accounts are and the split of the accounts are. So maybe they want to just keep coming back to this template and create it or turn it into a real requisition, not just a template. This field types is sometimes used with, I think, uh, third parties. I'm not really sure how it can be used, but it's a text field that can be used. And then the next section is kind of like this created date. It'll populate automatically. It's not a user. You can't type in it, anything in here. I'm trying to and nothing's typing. So then we're at the items of the requisition that you want to order. So you have a quantity of one. You can fill in the units. I'm going to order some. Oh, we're doing the bakery. Still, I need a shredder for the cafeteria department. And that's going to be $1,000. At the same time, I'm going to show you a split, too. 
because the Schrader is going to be used for both the athletic department and the cafeteria department because they're in the same building. So I'm going to charge both departments. Since it's a quantity of one, um, you want to split one by price. And I'm going to make this simple. Each one is going to get $500. I'm going to, it's just going to be an even split. And here, I'm not going to have the right account. I'm just demo demonstrating the split, not the correct account. So once that's allocated and this matches, I can accept close. And you can see it's split by price. If I have that wrong, I am able to delete it at this stage. Can add another item here or here. And I can also copy this item. And I believe it copies the split. It does. However, I'm going to show you a different kind of split. So I'm going to delete that and ask you to confirm. And I'm going to copy or add an item, I'm sorry, which would have been the same thing as clicking this. So this time, I want to split by the quantity. And again, this might not make sense because I'm ordering it from a bakery. But here was my example. Five computers. Um, each of them was $500. And you notice a different icon. This is split by price with a quantity of one. And this is split by quantity with quantity of more than one. So once I click that, again, that pop-up window or, or pops up. And this is where you can say, I want three computers at 500, three computers at $500, which was the unit price that you entered over here, to account 006 whatever account. And then I want the remaining two computers because I have a, a group of five to go to the athletic department. So here I can, if I know the account, I can start typing it. Actually it was at, uh, at the principal account and it starts popping up and then I can drop down. I can also use the drop down arrow. And I can also use the search button, which will bring up this window. And I know it's, a, um, what did I say, athletic? So I know it's a 300 count fund. And I know it's a supply, so I can start looking as it starts popping up and I can skip the function, I believe. Yep, and it continues to, pop up. I have the screen big for demo process purposes, but I believe when it's smaller, more of the screen can be seen, but I can actually drag and resize it in that way, as well as this button. It'll make it a big screen, just so you know. That's usually throughout the system as well on different pop-ups like this. So again, you can um, search in many ways. And then once you choose, we're gonna charge it to the basketball supplies. And you click on that row, it'll populate this row. So now again, you have, yeah, five at 500 is 2,500, it matches up here. I accept, I close this window and it's split. Um, if I wanted to reorder this, I can use these arrows, move up or move this line down to be below the computers for some reason. Again, this is copy. 
And then at the requisition process, you can also add attachments. So for instance, you might have um, the picture of the item that you want on Amazon, but you don't really care what vendor the department orders it from. You just want, you just, you're just showing what you want with this requisition, or it could be the order form or the sales quote or a contract, anything. Oops. I clicked on that, add files. This pops up and you can drag and drop or select files. And I do have a, I guess I got a couple of examples. Here's an order form. And it's attached here, which can be downloaded, be attached physically if needed. And that'll stay attached to the requisition. I believe there's, I know there's a JIRA issue for this to be, it's a feedback issue for this to follow through with the purchase order. So I believe this is all that I want. So I'm gonna click save. And again, because I have here, I, I'll click neither and I'll show you how I have to X out. Because these I think make sense. So at this stage, I can either edit the current purchase order or I guess we can talk about this clone button that popped up too. So the edit button, you can only edit and you don't have to necessarily edit just this one, but you do have other requisitions on the grid that you're allowed to edit as long as, and the rule is, I guess, as long as it's not converted to a purchase order, excuse me, and it's not in, it's gotta be in an open period. Because again, any transaction, which requisition is a transaction, any transaction that you're creating or editing must be in an open period. It doesn't matter what month you're currently in, but it's gotta be in an open period to change something. Um, so what fields you're allowed to edit will be available. And you can, if you wanted to edit this one, delete just one of them and just order the shredder and then save it. Now you have the cloned or the new edited requisition. And same thing with the cloning. It, it copies all the details so you can save it into a new purchase order or requisition. I'm so sorry. We're almost there to the stage of a purchase order. Okay. I think we talked about delete. You can only delete in an open period and as long as um, they're not converted. Uh, let's see. I'm checking my notes. I think View is like the detail of the requisition that we just entered. Talked about clone, delete, filtering. Let's talk about how to find requisitions that are either ready to be converted or ready or ready to be converted and may have attachments. So one of the re, the one of the ways that you can find whether they're converted or not is on this requisition grid. And this, I brought in a column converted, or maybe this, I think that's the default on this grid. If not, then you can pull it in with this more button. So I just want converted false because the ones that are truly converted can't be converted again. So here are my requisitions that need to be converted if approved. It still doesn't tell me which one of these, which I believe is this one, has an attachment. I don't think that there is a more button available on here because the workaround I came up with was using the advanced query here. So 
once you filter the, to the requisitions that are ready to be converted, if approved, you can open up that advanced query and you get this top grid. And right there, you can see the attachments. You click on that little carrot. And I'm going to say file name. Because remember when we attached, did I attach an order form? I attached that order form file. So I'm going to go by the file name is not, is not empty. Not null, it means not empty. So the file name is not empty on the attachment part. And then this is going to be true. T or true. I usually just use T. So then once I apply this query with this filter on the grid, oops, I can see that only these have the attachments. So this one has, these are good examples, permit, maybe a therapy contract, maybe pictures of office supplies and such. So now at this point, if you needed to attach that to the physical piece of paper, you would go to it and download it to get it. But at this point too, you can save your query and by tape, typing in whatever, the example quote just popped up, there we go. You can save the name of your query so that you can come back and use this, find attachments later. And I did that. So once you type it and click save, which I did before this training, it now is available for me to use anytime. So let me get out of this. Clear, hide. So we're at this grid again. I go into advanced query on tomorrow's day, load my query that I saved, and all I have to do is hit apply and boom, I get the same results. So I can use this query over and over and over, which is very helpful. So that's one way. You can also add, um, is it called the property to the requisition? Sorry for the scroll. We have some reports here, SSDT requisition detail or summary. And you can add, I believe, I thought you could add the attachment. Well, I know there is a report under here. Not only can you get your documentation link here, but this public USAS reports library can be helpful like in this situation because I know there's a report out there that somebody else wrote that gives me the requisitions that are ready to be converted with the attachment. So like an invoice list or not a requisition list. So let's go to that link. You click on that. They're kind of categorized by account, budgeting, transaction. And again, I apologize for scrolling down here. Requisitions not converted with attachments. It gives you the description. It gives you the file that you download and then import into the report grid. And it also gives you an example. So here's an example of the report if you wanted to use. It gives you the rec number that's ready to be approved, the date, the description, and the, if any of them has attachment. Now you see these last two don't. So this is out there for anybody to use. This is another requisition report created by somebody, a summary. So 
sometimes check out here if you're looking for a customized report because somebody might have already created it and shared it out here. All right. And another way to get information is also from the like requisition grids or any grids by using that report button. I did want to point out, let's go to the requisite, the report menu. You know, that report definition I was just talking about, you would end up importing it here and choosing wherever you save that report definition, usually probably in downloads. But I wanted to look, show you transactions. Um, Amanda talked about accounts and account-based reports. With requisitions, it's a transaction. So when you're processing like a transaction report, you're not limited by, sorry, the open or current period. Because it's a transaction report, you you can enter, I'll show you here, a date range, even if that posting period is closed because you're looking at transactions. When you're looking at account-based reports, you're getting like a specific point in time for that account. These are looking at the detail of the transactions, if that makes sense. So now we're at the point of going to the next process. We're ready to convert requisitions into purchase orders if the treasurer approves. So let's filter again, converted false. These are the requisitions that I could create or could convert. I'm going to check mark a couple and I can convert a few. And again, I wanted to point that out as I was telling you. The order of your selection here is the order of the signed purchase order number. So it was what, one, two, three, even though it's different order on the grid, if that makes sense. So it's the order that the user chooses is the order that the system assigns the purchase order number and converts it in that order. As I click convert, you can choose the purchase order date by the icon or enter it. The starting PO number, you can leave blank to auto assign and again that's based on like that transaction configuration that I showed you earlier. I'm gonna let it auto assign. And then I, if I'm for some reason, we don't wanna process this, I can back up, but I'm gonna go ahead and convert these three. It does give me the conversion results um, with any warnings. Oh. So I chose that template requisition, and I'm glad to point out that we have a template requisitions cannot be converted to purchase orders. That wasn't intentional, but I think somehow it was. So one failed, two converted. And these are the purchase orders that got converted. You can either click close here or there. I'm going to show you I think I was going to move to purchase orders. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. So the next process would be 
like what we just did convert into a purchase order. So in general, let's talk about purchase orders. And the purchase order is actually that binding agreement that the treasurer confirms there are funds there to convert or to cover the order. I don't know if you ever read this, but on that PO at the bottom, sometimes I think it's on the left, and maybe I've only seen it on the left because it was formatted that way. But it does say, I hereby certify that the above amount required to meet the contract, blah, 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 for the above has lawfully been appropriated, which is that budgeting process, or authorized or directed for the purpose of the treasury, blah, blah, blah. So with the signature, it is a, basically a binding agreement and it is now affecting the expenditure accounts on the encumbered amount. And this is also another message on the bottom of the purchase order. Just in case you've never looked at a default purchase order, it's always good to see what the user sees. So, Again, the variables per district can vary based on rules, account filters, and roles. I'm gonna be showing you an admin view again. But again, the purchase order, like the requisition, does not need to have a vendor. It can be a non-specific PO, which means either the vendor can be later assigned once you find out who you're really gonna order it from, or it can be multiple vendors. And the number of purchase order lines are not limited. Like, like you, you can go beyond 99 lines and that's not limited either. But keep in mind that the bigger it gets, it might, perform, might affect performance if it's like a thousand lines. But I can't imagine it, a purchase order being that huge. Okay, so let's go into the system and I'll show you some of these icons. Go to the purchase order grid. And I am just gonna reset my grid and make sure I'm at the default view. And we have a create. We do have a new button on this grid which is this one for invoice. You can't invoice a requisition because it wasn't really a confirmed purchase order. Excuse me. <clears throat> but you can invoice here a purchase order. But that's the next process. So we're just going to like move to the next one. And this one is print, view, edit, and delete. And same icons up at top, except for we do have a new one where you can import purchase orders with a CSV file. Now, again, in the documentation, it does give you that format, the criteria, as well as a template spreadsheet. And I'll show you that in a moment. But first, we're going to go in and create. You can see that it's very similar information like a requisition, except for it has a purchase order number. It does have these same icons at top. Same kind of date. I did want to talk about the date. I'm trying to find my place in my notes. This date up here is going to default to. Uh, the date entered or converted, the date created. Again, we know what delivered date is. That's when you, the district is gonna tell the vendor when they need to have it delivered by. But we also have this created date. That's gonna default to actually what the date that, you're, that you actually entered it. So you can change this, but you can't change today's date that we posted this. Um, there's also, uh, these are both 
populated by the system, the posted date. And we have a modified date, like if you end up going in and editing or amending the purchase order, which I'll show you later, it'll update this field. And this is probably, maybe I should look at a real purchase order that's already been converted. So you can see this hasn't been amended. It was created a couple of days ago using this date. And these are populated by the items listed below. Here's the split. You can review the totals on the accounts. As you are entering, let's pick a, sorry, it's this eyeball. <laughs> and then if this is a then and now purchase order, the system will mark this. So what a then and now purchase order is, when the invoice date is prior to the purchase order date. So say I received the invoice on March 1st, but there was no purchase order out there or requisition. So I created the purchase order after I received the invoice. It would automatically flag the user and mark this. Oh, and I have an example. I didn't go far enough in my notes because I have an example of that. Where it is very light, but it's marked as then and now because it obviously had a date uh, prior, the invoice had a date prior to January 19th. So, if you have purchase orders how can with that are then and nows and the treasurer's or the treasurer is asking like the accounts payable clerk what purchase orders are then and now this month how do you get that information you can actually use the more button and pull in that field it's somewhere there it is then and now once you click it, it'll come on your grid. And they'll ask the users this, or the treasurer will look for this so that they can be approved at the board meetings. So now, and again, grid columns can be dragged and dropped. So now it's back to the third column. And you can filter the grid by using then and now true. And here are my purchase orders that are then and nows filtered by date. And I do have two that are in January. And the other ones are old. So that's how you would find which purchase orders are flagged as then and now. Um, and to relate it to the expenditure account, like what Amanda was talking about. First, when we were in the requisition stage, it did not affect the accounts for the encumbrance because it wasn't encumbered until it's in this stage of a purchase order. So now that it's in a purchase order, it will affect the expenditure account. The let me pull up the account that I used. Seventy-five. Okay. So this is a purchase order. I'm going to go to that account that has the expenditure account that has that on the purchase order. Thank 
can't read my writing. <laughs> Here's me. Okay, so when it becomes a purchase order on the expenditure account, this increases because now the encumbrance is encumbered. On the appropriation account, and I'm not going to show you this, I'll just tell you that the appropriation account reduces the unencumbered balance. Because you're increasing the encumbrance, the appropriation unencumbered comes down. So that's the effect of the accounts from a purchase order. And now I would like to show you the um, importing a purchase order using a CSV file. And I screenshotted the file and it, I think I have more columns here, but these are the columns, columns that I wanted to talk about. And the links are here for the criteria and the template. And then I like on the screen, let me go to that PO screen. There's that import button that we'll be using. But here in the documentation, it explains that the item number. Oh, I didn't copy it at all because there's a charge number over here. But you can't, anyway, the point was you can import purchase orders even with a split. So the split that I showed you manually being entered can be done with a purchase order too. And the Let's, let's do that. I will find that file and I will show you that what we're gonna import. This one's not like indicated in red, but I'm going to leave the PO column blank so it auto populates. And I have the required fields up here formatted from that template. Um, the item number is the item of the purchase order. So this, and every time it changes to a one, that's a new purchase order. So the, this first purchase order has two for the bakery donut shop. This purchase order has two lines. And then this only has one line for the landscaping company. And then this purchase order, the Visa Hotel Travel, actually has four PO lines, but this one has a split. So... <clears throat> This is what I didn't screenshot. The reference number, here's the item number of the purchase order. The reference number is in regards to the charge. So like when you had that split, the first line of the split is reference number one. The second line of the split would be reference number two. Now going to the next PO line, it's, it would be like the third account line. I guess that's how you would, you would look at it is the first account on the PO, the second account, which those happen to be the split item, the third account on the second PO line, the fourth account and so forth, if that makes sense. These last three are only required on a split PO, but that's in the documentation too. But I'm gonna take this, this file and import it, choose my file. It's loaded and then, no, I mean, I chose and now I load it and I should get the conversion records 
loaded was four with no errors. I wanted to open this up because there was an error list listed. It would be listed in this top row. But so it is possible. It is nice. And that can be done. And you see that one was on that file was forget what was on that file. It was that donut shop right here. So they converted. Let me find my notes. To edit a purchase order, it must be in a, well, no, let's talk about the difference between edit when you click on that edit, it opens up this. So you have an option of editing or amending a purchase order. If your purchase order is still on your desk and has not been mailed to the vendor, you can edit the purchase order. And, oops, <laughs> what the heck, sorry. You can edit the fields applicable. If when you amend a PO, when you would use that button, it would be when the purchase order is already in the vendor's hands. And by amending it, you're basically documenting that change. So you're amending the purchase orders. However, when you amend, you can't change the vendor because you're assuming that that purchase order was already sent to the vendor. So you can't change the vendor without canceling the purchase order. You can also can't change the PO date or the actual items. However, if you did need to change the actual items and you can only amend at this point, you could copy the item. And if this wasn't, uh, I could copy that item to change the item since I can't change this. So change, amend item one for whatever reason. And then I could delete this line item with the setting of cancellation date. So that's how you would amend an item after it's been sent. We're just gonna go out of there. <laughs> so let's see, we talked about edit, amend, PO repair. The PO repair process. Well, first, to get to that, it's not like an icon on here. You actually have to uh, pull and view the purchase order before it becomes an option up here. Then you click repair, and you have the option to repair the account, the vendor, or the date. This can be useful too, because, oh, and you can only do this if there's been no payments made. But say you have five scholastic invoices sitting in payables and the purchase order had the wrong vendor because it, the PO had scholastic and you already invoiced it and you wanna, you now found out it's supposed to be scholastic number one. Instead of like canceling the PO and the invoices, what you would do is you would repair this rep this PO, change the vendor here, and then update it. And then those invoices that were sitting in payables that were already invoiced but not paid, not processed through the disbursements, those will be updated with this change. So that example I gave you was perfect. 
the user has the purchase order made out to Scholastic. They invoiced it and processed it. It's sitting in payables and they need to change the vendor to Scholastic number one. They would come here and repair the vendor. Now they can also repair the account. It went to the purchase service account 400 instead of the supply account and click update or you can change the date. And remember sometimes, most of the time these windows like can be moved and I moved it to see what date I was gonna change it to. I'm gonna change this one to today, update it and it'll give me a, besides the warnings, it'll give me this change result of what showing what changed for any of those repair options. This is the change result for the date with the option to print. Some people like to keep that on file. So then you can see that the date actually changed to the 16th. You can invoice, which is the next step from this point as well. Clone, amend, and edit. I believe we talked about all that. Are there any questions so far? Purchase order reports. Purchase order reports. Again, anything on this grid can be made into a report by this button. You can also go to the report manager. And we do have the canned version of the purchase order detail report, as well as the detail in the summary report. Those can be customized too. But again, in that report, shared reports. I was surprised how many reports are out there just for the purchase order. So check this out if somebody's wanting the purchase order detailed by a certain way because there's by date, by full account code, by fund and special cost center, all these things. And then again, there's an example report, the definition over here, as well as a description. So there's a variety that's already been created that you don't have to create. Okay, let's see. I must have got out of my demo. Okay, so requisition to purchase order. The next step is we receive the goods and we receive the invoice. So we actually have to create the invoice in the system to replicate the invoice that we received in the mail or email. And to do that, we go to transaction AP invoices. And just so you know, I included this on, on the purchase order. There is a spot on the default purchase order form where the user could verify the, the receipt of goods. I don't know how many people use this. I did use it at a district where whoever uh, received the items would enter what items were received that was on that purchase order and signed and dated before turning this into the treasurer's office. So I wanted to point that out. But when the user creates, you would choose the purchase order. Do I have a purchase order? Okay, so to create an invoice, you could either do it here. But since I don't know which purchase order I'm pulling up, I'm gonna go to the purchase order grid. And I did show you this before. On the purchase order grid, I can invoice as well. 
So I'm gonna Oh, I didn't want to print. I hit print or invoice, the invoice. Okay. This opens up the invoice and basically you're going to enter the actual invoice number. Um, it's going to default to the purchase order that you entered or clicked on. This is going to default to today's date. But you notice right below is the vendor's date. The this date is going to default to today, but say it is March as the current period. And hold on. But my treasurer in my district closes the month. So February is actually closed. So, but it is a February invoice that I received. So instead of, I can't enter a February date here because it's a closed posting period, but you wanna record the actual invoice date, it, you would put it here. So the actual invoice date was February 21st, but I'm actually entering it in the system today. So that's gonna default to the date. And this is gonna default behind the scenes and populate itself to the day that you create this. Same with these totals. And then we get to the items. And if you, excuse me, you can choose this item. You can choose all items or deselect all items. But I'm going to select only one of these items and say that the donuts for dads were, here are my item statuses. So let's talk about this. If I received all my donuts, it would be full order for that line item. If I only received three dozen out of the five, then it would only be a partial order. But if I'm going to only get three total, and I know that the, the three is all I'm going to get at this point, I could do a full because that's gonna be my final order. I'm not gonna get the other two that I ordered. I'm only gonna get three. So I'm gonna do that and say I only paid for $40 partial. And then again, I can fill it here or I could go over here to change it. You also notice that, again, I have my screen huge so that you can see it, but over to the right, you have a receive date. And this is where it becomes important, like towards the end of the fiscal year, because say this is, say that we're really June 16th right now, or no, I don't know where I was going. If I was July 16th, but I received, the items back in the prior fiscal year, you would put the receive date here. That's important towards the end of the year. So let's go ahead and save this invoice. If I put the date, although I think it'll default to, it will not default to the day after I cleared it out. Since I still have items on this invoice, it's going to automatically pop up the, that same purchase order in case I want to continually, um, like if I have another invoice, which say we do for the rest of the dad's donuts. Again, I can click here or over here. I like doing it over here. So either cancel. Oops, I didn't mean to cancel. So you can choose this. I think you can change it here. Okay, I'm not sure how that clear button works, but I thought if I click this, 
There we go. Maybe there was a slowdown in the internet. Okay, so yeah, I clicked that and hit there. Clicked it or filled or canceled. Any questions on these buttons or the invoice or the statuses? You can also, regarding those statuses, Say you have, let me pull this up. Say you have an invoice that was completely paid or filled, but you did receive those other two dozen of donuts and you want to open it up again. You would view that and see these action buttons over here. My tip is to always hover because I, to me, they're like, I will edit this. Oops, did not mean to do that. As you hover, it gives you the description. So if I clicked on this partial button, it's going to change it from, it's telling me that that second line, muffins for moms, I received a full order. So if I should have had more invoicing on that line, I could change it here and the invoice would be updated, and that line would be invoiceable. Same thing here. I, I like to hover to actually figure out if I'm doing it the right way, because this line was set as partial, and I'm not going to get those other, the, the rest of those $75. I'm going to change it to full. I'm not going to get more, any more dads for donuts. And so that's another way to update the invoice status and reopen up that line item or not, or to cancel that line item after it's been invoiced. You can also uh, import invoices. And the transaction menu in the system actually follows our document. So if I'm wanting to import AP invoices, I would go to that chapter. Here's that import criteria with that spreadsheet. So I, like I said, it gives you all the information that is needed in order to import, let me find my file. I have a file ready to import some invoices, which I believe I, actually have it in my notes, just a moment. Oops, <laughs> that took me. This is what happens when it's live. Let me pull up that. Spreadsheet. Import invoice. Here we go. Once you have it formatted by what the document says, again, it's a simple process. This might be helpful. Like if you have your the high school secretaries receiving invoices and they submit a spreadsheet to the treasurer's office prior to submitting the invoices to them, for instance. So I have all my information here, including the full and partial statuses, including the different vendor invoice dates versus the date. So I'm gonna take that in the instance and using this button, Again, I can choose that formatted file. Load them. And I have three errors and four, four that loaded. So 
So I must have forgot the PO number on one of the lines for the invoice. So like I said, when that produces that file, it'll give you what was wrong with it, as well as giving you this pop-up of what to look for. But you can see where this one did import correctly, the baker. Oh, that was the example that we were using, sorry. Okay. So that ability there. So now we have some invoices that we've invoiced and they're sitting now in the payables. And payables are processed invoices, but not yet paid, not yet dispersed. Um, so when you come to the transaction payable menu, you're sitting here and you have two choices by vendor, which could be the donut shop with five different POs or by detail, whereas you can see um, like the Serenity Cafe has a few different purchase orders and a few different invoices. So I could choose that vendor to, to pay all those invoices, or I could select uh, with this tab to only choose this one and keep that one later. Okay, let's see. So let's select a few. or you can select all. And as you post, this comes up. So here is where it actually takes you to the next process, which is creating that disbursement. So I feel like I jumped ahead in my notes, but give me a moment. I did kind of, before I go to this point, I wanted to show you another thing in that report library. Because there are reports out there that are the outstanding invoices by vendor name. Actually, I think that's in the reports too. to find out which ones are outstanding to invoice. Okay, so let's just go to the payables. We're gonna select certain invoices to process, post them, and I'll post the disbursements here. It shows that I picked three vendors, three invoices, a total amount. I can pick the date here and either return to this grid if I picked, if I meant to pick four or post, and it'll pop up to what I would see if I did this at the disbursement grid. So continue to print. Here's my payable conversion. And this actually takes you to the disbursement grid where now I can choose to open up to print the print file to, uh, or to actually assign the check number if needed to be. So the payable is the unpaid invoice. The disbursement is actually the payments to the vendor. And we can have different types of Disbursements, you can see here, there's accounts payable, there are refunds, 
and somewhere there are payroll. So those are the different types of disbursements, accounts payable, refund, and payroll. The different check types here are either check or electronic. The electronic is actually on the vendor. Let me show you the vendor. When this box, let me make it darker, on the vendor, you have the default payment type of check or electronic. If it's selected as this is, as electronic, when this disbursement is generated for this vendor, you, the user does not need to assign a check number. They can, but thus it's not required and it's technically not intended because it's electronic, but some people do want to assign a disbursement number. So let's go back to the disbursement grid. Okay. And the ones that we Another tip to find the disbursements that are ready to print and assign to a check number was this column that was way over before here. So I drag and dropped so it was more in the print in the middle of the screen. So printed. I want to find those disbursements that are, have not been printed. So I put false. There are the disbursements that are still waiting for um, a check number. So, excluding this void. If I can select several or all to generate, when I do that, based on the, this is telling me that's the highest check number on file under that system transaction configuration. If I want to, I don't think I selected them here. We'll select one of these that have the electronic payment and leave one out here. Generate print file. If I want that electronic payment to have a check number, I need to mark it here. I skipped this, but I didn't mean to. You can sort the print file by these four options, the pay name, the vendor name, the number, or the payable entry date. You also have two file outputs, XML for the print or the PDF. The neat thing about, and this is applicable to purchase orders, as any PDF file, so purchase orders, invoices, and this disbursement. Once you can create, you can have the default PDF, or you can upload a custom form, and I'll show you that custom form in a minute. But I'm going to ge generate the PDF. And you can see that it assigned the check numbers to those disbursements. Now, if I wanted to, I have a custom form for the electronic disbursement. I just had this created recently, so I thought I'd include it. Somebody wanted to have a separate form for just electronic disbursement. So this is what it's, how to do that is you create the form, click here, upload it, and here it's available. So then when you're in the disbursements, when you click the PDF, and you choose the PDF, you can click, you can choose that custom form. 
So instead of looking like a regular disbursement like this, the custom form is customized for the electronics only to look like this. So there's options available to customize PDF forms within the system. And I just wanted to show you that that, 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 that is available out there. Um, at this point, once it's been dispersed, that purchase order is no longer sitting out in payables because it's been paid. Like this is a different donut invoice. I paid the one that was for 75. And then this is the one that was 40. That was only a partial payment that I did not choose. So when the posting of the disbursement happens on the expenditure account, when it's paid, the current encumbrance decreases because it's been paid. So the amount expended gets increased on the account. So encumbrance goes down the expended goes up as it's dispersed. We're almost done. I wanted to show you the other options for disbursements, which would be to void. And to void a disbursement, it must be in the current fiscal year. So you can't void a check from last June. If you need to, you need to contact us. Um, and also the void date, once you click that and click void, this date has to be in an open period. So if January, if March wasn't open, I could not do this. Uh, the void invoice items. By default, this came in as checked. This will cancel the invoices that were associated with that disbursement. So the, the invoices are void. They're, the PO is now marked new. That PO line item is back to open and can be re-invoiced because the invoice has been voided. If you uncheck this, the items are not voided and will appear in the payables again. So if you, here's an example, you void the check and then you can edit the invoice. You uncheck this. And that was for Trudy Textiles. When I go back to payables, it, Trudy Textiles, or is in there. Now I can't edit, even in the detail the view, I cannot edit this invoice. What I would need to do is to go back to the AP invoice, not, and it's still out there, so I can edit it. Pull it up, edit the invoice, because it should have been $618. Save it. And it is still good to go under the payables. So that's the difference of using that void uh, invoice when you go to void void invoice items. And then to do so, whether this is checked or not, you'd confirm or cancel the return. Now you might have that void, the one that we just voided, I might've meant to do it for yesterday's date. So if I view that void by the eyeball, I have that option to change the void date. So I'm going to change it to yesterday. Click save and it's now changed. Again, that voided date that you're changing it to must be in an open posting period. Why? Because you're editing 
or change in a transaction. Sometimes if you post check or disbursements to the wrong sequence of numbers, like in one district, maybe the cafeteria check numbers have a different sequence. So when you were posting the regular check run, you use those checks numbers instead of the ones that you should have. Anyway, you can resequence the check numbers and change them to what they should have been without redoing the whole check run. You also have options to reconcile once you choose the different checks or just one, these open up and you can reconcile the checks. You will get a message and you just enter your date and click reconcile. You will get an error message if the reconcile, reconciliation date is before the check date. So for instance, I'm going to reconcile this check with yesterday's date. It shouldn't let me because the disbursement date was today. So how can I reconcile it yesterday? So this worked with the error message as well. And you know how you get going and you start reconciling checks and you might have found one that you shouldn't have. You also have that uh, the ability to unreconcile the same way. You check mark and then you click unreconcile, and it becomes outstanding again. There is this auto reconcile button. Just know that it's out there. Sometimes districts can get a file from the bank to automatically. Um, reconcile their checks. It's a file that once uploaded, it automatically does what we just did by choosing and clicking the button. I'm not going to get into that today, but that is an option. Um, I think I covered everything. Does anybody have any questions? We did pretty good on time too. So tomorrow we are going to go into the receipts and refund process. So if you guys don't have any questions on the expenditure process, or if you do think of them in going forward, just let us know and we'll be happy to help. If you need any help customizing forms, just let us know. And thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.